Ali. <laughs> My name is Chelsea and welcome to my Grass Dancer Chronicles series. The Grass Dance Chronicles is a series of videos where I show you how to make each piece of a grass dance regalia. In this video, I show you how to make the yolk of the grass dance regalia. In other words, the yolk is the upper fringy portion that you will see in the thumbnail. So a few disclaimers before we get started. Of course, I will list all the materials that I used in the description box. So if you're wondering what I used or where I got them, go look there. I also want to state that um, this is a vlog tutorial, so it's not a tutorial. In other words, I don't know the complete ins and outs of making grass dance regalia. Um, I am just a seamstress, I am a crafter, I'm a regalia maker, and a lot of the things that I do are self-taught in me figuring things out. So, with that being said, um, just because you would do something differently than what I did doesn't necessarily mean that I'm doing it wrong. And just because I do something differently from you doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong either. We all do things differently and at the end of the day, we accomplish the thing that we set out to do, which is make a beautiful regalia. But I will say, um, I do welcome tips and tricks in the comments. So if you have anything to share or anything that you would do better um, <laughs> or differently, go ahead and leave a comment. I just ask that you be respectful. And if you're watching because you're using this to figure out how to make your own regalia, um, then go look in the comments. You might find some good information in there as well. And finally, one more thing before we get started, because the video is already filmed and edited and put together, I don't really have another chance to mention something that I missed mentioning. Uh, and that is a piece of material that you can use that I didn't. I just wanna talk about it real quickly so that you know that that's an available option for you to do which is using interfacing to make your yolk more solid and sturdy. So what would you do with that interfacing? Um, you'll see in the video what I mean if this is a little confusing to you, but real quickly I'll explain. We're gonna make a front panel and a back panel. Each of those panels has uh, two layers. So you'll have the outer layer that would have like all your applique designs on it. And then you'd have an inner layer and they'll be you know sewn together uh, you'll do that twice once for the front once for the back so before you sew those two layers together you can cut a piece of interfacing and fuse that to the inside and then sew them together and then i'll just give it a little bit of sturdiness and with all of that being said let's get into the construction of a grass dancer yoke Okay, so excuse the mess. Um, those of you who just want to see how I go about things, this part's for you. Um, if you feel like you have other methods of drafting and measuring out things, do that. Or if you just wanna hold fabric up to a body and cut it accordingly, you can do that too. But um, I'm just a little more particular with how I do things. So the first thing that I did was basically draw a box. Um, I began drawing at the width of their shoulders. So from the, t the outer tip of their shoulder all the way to the other outer tip of their shoulder. Now their uh, waist is gonna be smaller than the width of their shoulders. So at the bottom here, I found the width of their waist um, and sort of decided how wide I wanted the yoke to be. So I marked those points and added a half inch for seam allowance. As you can tell, I was sort of undecided with where that was gonna be a few times, but um, I tried to make the lines that I ended up choosing darker. Oh, so the, there those are. Now I am doing a design where it's going to be pointed. It'll have two points. Um, so I'm leaving a half inch of seam allowance on either side of the point. Hopefully you can see that. I can zoom in a little. Right, so here is my actual point. This will be uh, the end product. And then this is the seam allowance. And on the other side will also be a seam allowance. 
for the uh, middle point, I just pointed it up. I sort of eyeballed it. I said, you know, about right here looks nice. And then I added a half inch for seam allowance, connected the dots. Uh, up here for the neck hole, this is where I had to play around a lot. As you can see, there's a lot of lines. This bold one will be the official cut. Um, and with seam allowance, it'll open up another half inch. And I wanted that to be wide enough to fit their head through, um, as well as just not having too much in the shoulders, which this is the official cut that you're seeing, um, what, how wide the shoulder will actually be is about right there. I almost forgot to talk about <laughs> the depth of the neck hole, which is pretty important. So. What I did to make this easier for me, make sense, is I started taking my measurement from the very tippy top of the shoulder, right where that shoulder seam is going to sit on their shoulder. And I just laid the measuring tape straight down on their chest until I found the hollow of the neck. If you don't know what the hollow of the neck is, it's just that little sort of hollow area where the collarbone meets in the center of your neck. Um, I want to say their hollow is probably like right here. So, so if I uh, if I make the fabric a little lower than the hollow of the neck, then that should make the hole big enough to fit over their head, and it also should have it low enough that um, they're not feeling like it's a turtleneck or anything. So. Uh, to find that then, I after I take that measurement, then I start measuring from not, including the seam allowance by the way, I start measuring from where that's going to be straight down and mark it. Um, instead of adding a half an inch when you're forming a hole, remember that um, adding seam allowance in a hole, you're actually taking away a half inch. So what I mean by that is like, Say you want the hole to be this big once you finish sewing, once the product is finished. When you mark seam allowance, um, like adding it, say I, I start here and I'm like, okay, I wanna add a half inch. You're gonna actually make the hole bigger because this fabric right here is what's getting taken away. So when you're, again, working with a hole, like in the neck, um, adding seam allowance is actually deducting that half an inch because this is the fabric that'll be taken away and that'll be the final hole. Anyway, let's move on. I do also want to point out that when you're forming shoulders, you don't want to leave that boxy shape. You want to start at the outer um, corner, which is like the outer point of the shoulder and take it down. I took it down about an inch. Um, and then, well, I guess I really only took a, it down a half inch because with seam allowance, once the item is sewn together, it'll be about an inch. And that allows for that downward slope that our shoulders naturally have. I also want to point out that I am only making one size of this because sometimes you might want to make the front longer or you might want to make the back longer for whatever reason, um, either doing those things are there those are great uh, there's no reason to not do it except for design purposes and for me i i think i'm just going to do the front and the back the same length so now my next step is to go ahead and cut out this pattern piece um, for me it's gonna take a few minutes but for you it's right about now <laughs> so here is my pattern piece <laughs> Now the next step is to lay this piece of paper onto my fabric and cut the fabric out. Um, and I'm going to cut four pieces of this. And that is because uh, two pieces are going to be for the front of the body and two pieces are going to be for the back of the body. Now if you are someone who did two different sizes because you have a different size for the front and a different size for the back, then for you, you're going to cut two pieces for each pattern piece. And the reason for that is because um, we'll have the outside fabric and then we'll have the other one sort of lining the inside, sitting against the body. 
that outside fabric is going to be the visible one that has all the applique and design on it. For now, that is going to be the only step that you and I are going to share just for a little bit. Later on in the video, I will get going on the uh, construction of the yoke. But for now, this is my base fabric and I need to put applique and designs on it and your applique and your designs are going to be a little different. So I will take you along with me in designing the yoke and provide you know all the instructions that you need for constructing the piece together later on. All right, so I went ahead and completed one side of the yoke. So now I'm going to show you how to turn this into this. First thing we're going to do is place the outer layer and inner lining right sides together and then pin into place. I'm not sure if my lining was bigger because I cut it that way or if the process of sewing the applique on warped the outer layer, but no matter, just trim away the extra so they match in size. With a straight stitch, sew along the neck hole, the sides, and the bottom. Leave the shoulders open. I want to mention here that I will be applying the fringe to the underside of the yoke later. If you're wanting your fringe, whether it be string, ribbon, yarn, to be placed between the two layers so that it's coming out from the seam, you would place the fringe into place before sewing these seams. I also started sewing the neck hole and side seams a half inch from the shoulder edge. This is because I want that last little bit open to create two separate flaps on the shoulder. Whenever you have sharp curves, always cut notches into the seam allowance. Close to the stitching, but careful not to cut into it. And whenever you have sharp points, cut off the corners of the seam allowance. Another tip, when you have an inverted point like this, cut the seam allowance at the point. We'll be trimming more seam allowance in a minute, but before doing that, press your seams open now. And I know some of y'all like to skip the ironing step, Please don't skip ironing because it makes your seams look more crisp and clean and will actually make turning this thing right side out easier for you. Now for the side and bottom seams, trim the seam allowance to about a quarter inch from the stitching. Doing this will reduce bulk at the seam. Through either of the shoulder openings, doesn't matter which one, funnel the yoke through that opening to turn it right side out.
If you have any sharp points like I do, you may need to use some sort of tool to push the seam into the form of a point. I used a pen here, but if you worry about the ink, you could use a small dowel, skewer, pencil, anything with that sort of shape. And of course, don't make me lecture you about ironing again. Follow these same steps to create the second panel. Then we'll join the front and back panels together at the shoulder. If you're more of a beginner at sewing, you can simply do a straight stitch on each shoulder with the panels right sides together. This will leave the seam allowance exposed, so be sure to fray block it. But I'm going to be doing something a little different today in order to hide the seam allowance. If you're comfortable with doing this step, follow along. If not, just sew the shoulders together and fray block. Okay, so this is where those shoulder flaps we left open come in. With the panels right sides together, I'm separating each shoulder opening and working only with the flaps of the outer layers. In other words, when you join the panels together, you'll have four flaps total. Pin the two middle flaps together and pull the two outer flaps aside. Once pinned into place, sew a straight stitch, being careful not to catch the two outer flaps. Separate the panels and lay the yoke flat. Now out of those four flaps, pull three of them away from the fourth flap, with the fourth being on the back panel. Then fold those three flaps under the fourth flap, taking your time to manipulate the layers so they lay flat. Now working with the fourth flap, fold about a quarter inch of the flap inward and lay it flat against the fabric before pinning it into place. Then straight stitch near the edge of that fold to secure it. Be mindful that this stitch will be visible on the outside, so choose a color of thread that matches the outside layer of the yoke. Now, there are so many different ways to do regalia, and with that, there are so many different ways to do fringe. With this set, I chose a nine inch long chainette fringe, and I chose to attach it to the underside of the yoke. It's up to you what type of fringe you want and where you want it placed, whether it's on the underside like this, in the seam, or on the outside so that the chainette is like a visible decoration. I do want to note that I also have a video on how I made yarn fringe and attached it to the outside, and I'll include that in the playlist. To attach the fringe, I started at one of the points on the bottom of the yoke. I think most of you will be able to do the same, however, those of you with a round shaped yoke might want to start your fringe at a shoulder seam. I'm lining up the edge of the chainette with the edge of the panel and pinning it into place. When I reach the end, I'm not going to cut the chainette just yet in case it stretches or scrunches during sewing. It's best to cut after sewing so it isn't too long or too short. I used a zigzag stitch to sew on the chainette. Be mindful this is a visible stitch, so choose your thread color accordingly. For example, this stitch is landing where I have orange ribbon, so I used orange thread in order for it to blend in more. Now cut the chainette, being mindful of where the strings are. I am glad I waited to cut because the chainette did stretch out a bit during sewing. And then you continue this process until you've attached all the fringe that you want to attach. Here I'm just showing how I left a little space for the next chainette. 
and eventually I show how I shape the chainette around the inverted corner. Here I'm just pinning the chainette down um, in its new direction first and then I'm sticking a pin in that point where it changes direction. And here it is, the finished product. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next edition of the Grass Dance Chronicles.